My name is Jack Koenig. I'm a, a staff engineer at Sci-5. I'm one of the maintainers of the Chisel and Fertile projects. And um, I'm not here to talk that much about Chisel. I'm mainly here to talk about kind of how you, how you compose you know, hardware together, how you build SOCs. So my talk kind of is related to um, Alexis, my colleagues previously. So he t told you about Do, and I'm going to tell you about um, kind of the, the larger vision of what we're trying to do. Um, all right, so the original title of my talk was Onboarding Verilog IPs to Rocket Ship, but um, unfortunately, I don't think that talk is quite ready. <laughs> so my talk that I'm really going to talk about today is uh, building composable hardware generators. And um, the, the talk that I want to give, which will be a lot longer, um, we'll, um, my colleague Henry Cook and I will be giving at the RISC-V Summit, so hopefully some of you will be there or can view it later. Okay, so first of all, like, why do we care about generators? I know some of you here are doing similar things, um, but some of you probably are not and are curious about that. And so, um, uh, Luis stole a bit of my thunder. Well, not my thunder, Yonsep's thunder yesterday, but I have some of the same slides. Uh, and um, so first of all, how did Instagram turn into a $1 billion acquisition with only 13 employees? Uh, th sorry, these are, these are Yonsep's slides. He's, he's very good at making slides, I'm not, so can get a little borrowing. Um, but you know, how do they do that and why why is it that in a silicon project needs at least 14 disciplines, according to Yonsep's count? Some of you may count more, maybe less, but a lot of people just to build a chip, to build an ASIC. Um, well, the basic idea is that you have this massive stack of software that you didn't write that you can take advantage of to build whatever you want. So Instagram is just some small amount of code, relatively small you know, amount of code on top of all of these open source projects, on top of commodity hardware infrastructure, right? And so why is it that we don't have this kind of thing in hardware? Well, all of us here are trying to do this, right? That's why we're at an open source hardware conference. And so our vision at Sci-5 and what we're trying to build is the same as everyone here, which is obviously why we're here. <laughs> um, so the goal is that we have all of this commodity infrastructure, like RISC-V as an open source ISA that we can extend. You know, you can have your proprietary extension, and yet you can share all the benefits of Linux and porting all of the, all of the software. Uh, Chisel is a hardware generation language that allows you to write composable generators. It's obviously open source, the open source fertile compiler as well. And then other important technologies like TileLink as a bus interconnect that includes cache coherency. And as you heard in Zvonimir's talk, you know, now we have it over Ethernet. Um, and then th what I'm talking about here are the federation tools, which are um, some open source tools that I'll get into. And then potentially, you know, the infrastructure, we want people to provide commodity infrastructure. Sci-5 is, is doing this with our cloud services and other companies uh, presumably are or will as well. So the idea is that we should copy these innovations from the software industry. Now these aren't that innovative to anyone in this room. You know, open source standards, abstraction and code reuse, composability and APIs. You know, you need tooling and you want commodity infrastructure to run your stuff. It's kind of hard. Um, like one of the really nice things about um, Amazon F1 is you have FPGAs in the cloud now. And I know everyone here probably likes to have an FPGA on your desk, but it is kind of a barrier to entry into our field. And it's really nice if you don't have to have that in order to test your design. Um, and one, ca one thing I should mention, I, I tend to talk in terms of ASICs because that's what we build at Sci-5. I know many of you, your, your targets are FPGAs, but to us, FPGAs are very nice for you know, simulating the designs. And it's really important to be able to simulate and run real software on what you're trying to build. Um, so, you know, an important observation here is that we do have reuse in hardware. We have IP, right? And anyone who's built an ASIC has purchased a lot of IP. Um, but the, the thing that really is a sticking point here is what does it mean to onboard an IP? Everyone's heard that term. Um, well, first of all, you instantiate the IP, including parameterization. Alexi talked a bit about this. They have their nice little GUIs to help you parameterize their, their Verilog or VHDL. You connect the standard interfaces, you know, hopefully TileLink or Wishbone, but it might be AMBA as well, of course. Um, you need to then handle the non-standard interfaces. That part's really fun. <laughs> uh, usually what you'll do is you'll have your standard interface and then you will add some memory mapped registers that will then control the non-standard aspects of it. Or you may just connect that non-standard part to something else, right? You may have a PHY and it may have some weird interface between the controller and the PHY. You need to implement the memory map, right? How else are you gonna control it from software? You need to write software drivers so that you can actually use the thing. You need to test it. You need to document it, right? If I sell a product with a USB IP and I don't talk about the USB IP, then no one can use it. And you, of course, don't forget about the physical design. I'm putting a star there because I'm not talking about that, but I did not forget about it. <laughs> it's just not the purpose of this talk. So what's the problem with all of this? There's a lot of manual work involved. Um, anyone who's done this, like, 
for complex IPs, it takes man years, basically, or person years um, to, to do this. And you must do this for every single design for every single IP. Um, and you know, there's a bit of reuse between multiple tape outs if you're in the same technology usually, but it's, there's a lot of work every single time and then every single company is doing this for every single IP. So our vision is to automate this onboarding. So that's a lot about what Alexi was talking about. Um, we want machine readable metadata, so we have the do format, um, where you have parameters, you have the interfaces, you have the memory map. We want parameterized documentation snippets. So this is something that people don't frequently talk about, but for Sci-5 where we're selling products, we have to give documentation to our customers. So if we onboard an IP, it has to be documented. And if it's parameterizable, the documentation has to be parameterizable. Um, you have to have software drivers, and these software drivers need to work across different designs. So it's great if you have this USB IP, but if you're using it in a Linux-capable system versus a, you know, an embedded system, it's very different how you use it. So you need drivers that work on these different systems across all these parameterizations, across all the designs you're trying to build. Um, you need verification IP to make sure it works because, you know, as much as we like to trust the things that we build, you know, sometimes they're buggy. You need integration software tests to make sure it's actually going to work when you boot the chip up. And of course, still, don't forget about physical design, which I'm just not going to talk about anymore. <laughs> So um, we, use, we picked the term federation to talk about these tools. Um, if you look in the dictionary, it's the action of forming states. Um, you can read that. But basically, you have some amount of centralized control, but really the smaller divisions have some um, you know, internal control. And so to, our use of it is it's a suite of open source tools that, we, uh, that we're using to orchestrate SOC design, where each piece has some amount of its own control. It's like its own IP, right? You can test it, use it in different ways, but ideally you can also aggregate these things together to create a complex design. So the purpose of this is to enable a modular SOC design methodology. The point is that you have lots of different IPs that you want to pull into your workspace. You have lots of different tools, right? So these IPs might be USB devices, it might be your, your pipeline, it might be your interconnect generation. Uh, you also have tools like Chisel or Verilator or whatever you're using to build your chip. And the point being that you can pull these things together into a workspace, you can get some work done on whatever you're working on um, while easily using other people's work, whether in the open source or not. Um, oh yeah, and the tools that I'm talking about are Wit, Do, and Wake. I'll gloss over Do a little bit because you just heard a whole talk on it um, and talk about the others a little more. So what is Wit? Well, you might guess from the pun on Git, it's kind of related to that. Um, it's, well, it's an open source repo. It's a tool for managing dependencies between Git repositories. Um, it's kind of like Git submodules, um, the goal being that it's like a better Git submodules. Um, it's a supplement to, not a replacement for Git. So um, we, we use Git and then we use Wit to orchestrate multiple Git repositories. Um, it, the important part here is that it provides a flexible yet reproducible and deterministic resolution algorithm. So, you know, Git, for anyone who's used Git submodules, whenever you need to divide your work into multiple repositories, it's a huge pain. Um, because if you are trying to have complex dependencies between repos where, you know, one, like repo A may de depend on version V and repo B may depend on version V prime and then you try to construct a complex project, get submodules to start is a, you know, is a tree where you get all the versions and frequently what we want is we want to pick the right version. Um, so it gives us a flattened directory structure with each repo once and importantly it enables developers to develop across multiple repositories. It's not a very complex tool, it's really just about resolving these dependencies. And so this is allows multiple people with multiple workspaces to, you know, do the work that they're trying to do. Um, some of this that is a little more subtle and I probably don't have time to get into too deeply is that when you divide your project into smaller pieces, it makes it easier to write testing for it independently. It's, it's really easy in hardware to build these complex things, these really big hardware designs. And then, it's then in that, and when you do that, it makes it hard to write unit tests. It makes it hard to localize where the failure is. And so it takes, it's, a, it's really software engineering here. This is like, you need to design things in a smaller way so that you can test it on its own. And then that may allow you to create a better reusable component. And so the purpose of what WIT is doing is to enable us to have these smaller pieces because at least we found at Sci-5 that it was, we frequently just put everything in the same repository. If it was open source, it went into rocket ship. If it was closed source, it was state internal. And then you end up with this like massive amount of code that you can't test on its own. And so our new methodology that we're deploying is trying to split this stuff up. Um, okay, so now 
briefly about do, which you already heard about, so I'll probably fly through this. Um, you know, it's a manifest document capture, capturing the intent. Um, you've heard all of this, I think. The idea being that you can package your stuff up to make it reusable. Um, yeah, I'll leave that there for just a second, but you just saw a talk about this, and for anyone viewing this in the future, you should go back and watch Alexi's talk to learn more about do. Um, but the basic idea is that we want some data format such that we can take IPs written in whatever language and onboard them into our chisel-based generator work. Um, generator, but we also hope that when we wrap our IPs in these formats that other people who are using a different workflow can do the same thing. We want our stuff to be usable and we want to use other people's stuff, so we want to have some format such that we can, can articulate our designs to be reusable. Um, and, uh, you know, basically what I was saying there, uh, you have your package, it can generate all of these things. You know, I mentioned a lot of stuff involved in IP onboarding, um, and it's beyond just instantiating a module and making sure you can connect it to your bus. I mean, we need to know about the memory map. We need to have documentation. We need to, you know, if it's Linux, we need to generate DTS. And all of these things are the types of stuff that we generate from the do document for IP that we onboard. And we, you know, hope others will do as well. And the hope here is that there's a single source of truth. So all this information is encoded in that format. And you can then automatically generate what assets are needed. So rather than having to write your DTS by hand, you'll just generate it from the do format. Um, and importantly, we hope that it lowers the barrier to adopt your chip design framework because if, like let's say you are very skeptical of Scala and you prefer Python and you want to, but you want to be able to reuse the things that are in the open source, we're hoping that this format will make it to where you can, you can implement the same things and then you can reuse all the code, whether, like whatever language or framework you're, you're, you're building. All right, and the last one I'm going to talk about is called wake, which is a pun on make. Um, so you might guess that it has to do with building things. Um, also an open source repo. It's a tool and language to make build systems composable. Um, an important part of this that we found, you know, we were using a make flow internally, and we found that every time we write highly composable generators, and the problem was when you had a new parameterization, you had to make a new make file. And that's not particularly useful. So um, uh, wake is our way of, you know, make is a language. And if you start trying to write functions or stuff in make, you'll very quickly run into the limits of it. You'll end up writing inline bash scripts and things like that to do complex work. And we thought that it would be better to embed that into the, the language we're using to describe the build itself. So the point being that we can plug these packages together and compose them without having to change the source. Um, so wake has a lot of features. I don't have too much time to dwell on this. I'm actually not sure how long I've been talking. <laughs> um, so I'll try and move very quickly. Um, but it, one of the really important things is dependent job execution. So when you have a generator, what you do next depends on what you built. And you want to have your, your, your build flow such that you can do that type of branching or dependent job execution based on what you're actually building. If you're building a Linux core, you need to do very different stuff than if you're building an embedded core. Yet we can reuse the same code for both. That's what we're trying, that's what we're building. It has dependency analysis, um, which allows us to do some, to build very robust builds and allows you to do a lot of cool stuff. Build introspection to determine what it did, what it knows. A really neat feature there is like, if your build is failing, you don't know why, you can, it'll generate a bash script to redo what it did so that you can just see exactly what jobs it ran. Uh, it's an intrinsically parallel language, so you, know, you can obviously do similar things in any language. You could write Python to do a build, of course, but the thing is that if you want parallelism, now all of a sudden you have to manage the parallelism yourself. Well, wake is intrinsically parallel, so if there is parallelism, it will find it and it will run it, um, which is really neat. I mean, that's kind of why make exists. Make is parallel, it's just not a fully featured language. Um, and then a work in progress feature is shared build caching, such that when you run your tests, if you actually ran them like you're supposed to, then when you plug it into CI, it already ran the tests, so it doesn't need to rerun everything. And it can determine, based on the semantics of what you built, if it needs to run the tests. Um, if, if any of you are familiar with Basil, or Basil, a uh, build tool from Google, it's similar in that regard, in that it will hash the, the artifacts of each step and can determine if it needs to run the next step. So if you change your readme, none of your tests rerun. And that's like a pretty sweet feature that just comes by using the language. You don't have to, we don't have to write any special code to check that like most people are doing, where it's like, oh, if you touch these files, run the tests. It does that automatically. Um, so I'm supposed to be talking about Rocketship, so what about Rocketship? 
Um, the idea here is that we can onboard IPs easily, so you have some IP block, um, you know, a parallel I.O. simple block. We can plug it into a test socket, which will pull in the ro you know, a rocket processor. We can write code and run on it, but the point, the, the, the goal here is that if you've onboarded this PIO block to this simple single rocket core design, then you've onboarded it onto everything that uses this framework. So our goal here being that you can test it against a single rocket processor, but then we can integrate it into a multi-core Linux-capable design um, with no changes to what you did. Just by onboarding it onto this simple test socket, you've onboarded it to everything. That's kind of like what we're building. Um, there's a dependency graph of the open source packages that are used here, and um, there's a list of projects that we have right now. Um, yeah, so I, that's it. So I guess I'll open it up to questions. The world already has a huge amount of build tools, and you all said uh, that Wake is similar in functionality, at least the one you mentioned, to yep. Bazel. What differentiates it, differentiates it from Bazel? Yes, um, I'm hoping that my colleague, uh, Wesley Terpstra, who built Wake, will give a talk about this more so that we can get like, m more fundamental details. Uh, the main difference, so, so, so Bazel has a lot of similar things, like I said. Um, the one really big difference is the, uh, the dependent job execution. So in Bazel, you can write, uh, what is it, Starlark? Something like that. There's like a, a subset of Python that you can use to do dynamic stuff. Well, it's extremely limited in what you can express. And that's for good reason, because if you had access to all of Python, like I said earlier, it's not parallelizable automatically. You would have to manage that parallelism yourself. And in order to be a build tool that's useful, you need to be parallelizable. So they have this extremely limited subset that to allow you to do what you do. Wake is different because the entire language is parallel. So everything you can express in it can be parallelized. And that's like a really powerful feature. It's not necessarily useful for every project, right? If you only have one design point, then you don't need all of this power. And that's fine. Um, I think Basil's a great tool, and you should look at it for that type of thing. But we have very complicated generators. We have huge CI problems where it takes hours to integrate designs into our internal code base. So some, I, I was mainly talking about IP onboarding. A lot of the features of Wake have to do with the larger problem of building generators. Um, and how do you create reusable build flows for all these different parameterizations of what you're building. Oh, along with, with Basil or Basil, it also seems it has a lot of overlap with FuseSock. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you can comment on that, but is there also a core format so you can share like what this package provides and what files to bring in and that kind of thing? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So there is definitely some overlap with FuseSock, but there's a lot that are being done a bit differently. So FuseSock has understanding of hardware and how to build it. There's no understanding of hardware and how to build it here. These are, these are generic tools because like building the hardware and simulating it is only a fraction of the problem. We have like all, a lot of other stuff to do with like building, you know, we got to build Linux <laughs> and we have to build all of the software, run all of our tests. So I think that there, there is a little bit of overlap, but I think that they're also somewhat complementary. And so it's, we don't have any, like do is the way that we describe the hardware format. So I think that's where the core, like co the core files in, in the do format might overlap and could potentially generate each other. But like wit, the only overlap is that it fetches git repos. Like that's a super simple tool. It's not doing anything sophisticated. Um, and, mi and wake is a generic like build tool. So I think, I don't think that like they're kind of different and potentially complementary, I hope. Then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, thanks.